Glad you're all here this morning. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, last week, as you know, uh, Pat and I weren't here. We were over at the Bridge Church, and then uh, Jeff and Sandy Lytle were here. And I understand the crowd was kind of light on this end, but if you weren't here, you missed it. Uh, did we get that recorded for last week? Oh, great. So that'll be up on the Internet. You'll be able to to uh, hear Jeff and, and Sandy and uh Jeff is one of my favorite people in the world, but he's also one of my favorite preachers. I love to hear him speak. He's just an anointed man of God. And Pat and I went over there, and they loved on us, made us feel great. Uh, I was telling some folks this morning, I, uh, one fellow was uh, kind of introduced. He was an elder in the church, and he was saying, you know, we've got this ready for we're doing this. We're, we'll, this is the program set up. And he said, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, holler Terrell, and I'll come running. And I went, Terrell? She used to work at Toyota. I worked with that guy for four years. And uh, he says, well, you used to be, uh," and I said, yeah, 150 pounds. And he says, wow, and you used to have, uh, I said, yeah. He said, you were a lot smaller too. Smart aleck. Anyway, we had a great time. Um, We did. We just, uh, it was was a fun day for us. Had a wonderful worship uh, service. And um, I think that we're, uh, uh, going to build on on this relationship with that church and kind of be sister churches like um, Southland and Southeast are. <laughs> maybe someday we'll be as big as them, but uh, that that's kind of the direction that maybe we're we're headed with them. <clears throat> so um, anyway, you uh, hopefully will be seeing them back again. Another thing that we have in common is is that when Jeff took over that church, he uh, one of the first things he did was he instituted an Ironman there. So, of course, at the mountain here, we have Ironman on Saturday morning. This is the the headquarters of Bluegrass Ironman. And then uh, they started a chapter there on Wednesday evening. So we're cousins of some relation with each other, I'm sure, by now. Matter of fact, last year in October, we had uh, what we call a, a bluegrass shootout at Jeff and Sandy's uh, farm in um in Lancaster, and we went out there, and uh, Rufus Thompson, who's taught here, has provided about 6,000 rounds of 22 long rifles. I remember, Mike, you had a ball. You had an absolute ball there. He was like a little kid at a carnival. He, he just had a lot of fun, and I did too. But uh, if, if, you're, if you have no experience with any kind of firearms, um, it was a safe. Adam had never shot a gun before in his life. He grew up in Malaysia, and there aren't firearms there except with the police and the military. So... Uh, That was kind of a neat thing for him to do, but it was a very safe environment. A lot of people we thought would say, well, I don't know if I want my kids to be around that. It's a little dangerous or something like that, but it really wasn't. Uh, When I went to the firing range, and I've I've had a concealed carry license for 10 years, 15 years, something like that, and I bought my first rifle 42 years ago, 44 years ago, so... um, you know, I'm I'm kind of experienced with that. But when I went to the range to shoot, there was a, a safety range master was right on my shoulder, and just in case you know I didn't know what I was doing or I did something stupid, they were there. So safety, 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 safety. So anyway, we're gonna <clears throat> and I love this line: Barack Obama's worst nightmare is a bunch of Christians with guns. <laughs> he just I'm sure he didn't like that. But we're gonna try to do it again this year. And what we're gonna do <clears throat> is have the Mountain and Bluegrass Ironmen and the Bridge Church with their Iron Man, and Brookside ba- uh, Broadway Christian Church with their Iron Man. They do an Iron Man uh, intermittently. So we'll have those three churches kind of partnering together with three Iron Mans that are in those churches. And that'll be a really cool thing. We're going to go out on <clears throat> a Saturday morning. I think we're looking at uh, somewhere around the 20th of September. Uh, so we'd go out and do Iron Man. Women be uh, allowed and welcome to come to Iron Man, the kids and stuff. And so we'll do breakfast, do an Iron Man lesson, go to the range, have some fun there. We had games for the kids last year, did a cookout for lunch, and it was a whole day event. It was until 5 o'clock. So anyway, we'll keep you uh, uh, <clears throat> in the loop as that is plans for that uh, come around. But that'd be a cool thing, that those three churches, Ernie Perry, is at Broadway, and uh, he and I did Iron Man for eight years together at Southland. So we have uh, Ernie's going to speak, and I'm going to speak, and Jeff's going to speak. So the three pastors from the three Iron Men's, I think it would be a really cool thing. So I'll keep you uh, informed as details come ahead on that. 
Well, today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about who we are, not only as individuals, but as a group. And one of the, the nicest titles that I think anybody could ever be called, a name that we could be called, is that of a Christian. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, history holds um, names of all the world changers throughout history. Some of them we remember, some of them we don't even know. But people who have affected mankind, their names are kind of indelibly marked in us. They forever f affect a society. Some people that are kind of uh, history changers affect society for good. Some people uh, for evil come from a whole different set of circumstances. Many of them, their lives end in a lot of different ways. But uh, these movers and shakers of history mark mankind, whether we uh, recognize their names or not. Some of them have inspired us. Some of the names that come out through history are, are very inspirational, and some of them repulse us. And some names that I came up here, one of them was Moses. Moses was the deliverer that led the uh, Israelites out of captivity in Egypt. Alexander the Great. He conquered the whole known world. Everyone knows that name. Joan of Arc. CJ and I talked about that earlier today. Joan of Arc was a defender of France. Uh, burned at a stake, CJ, but defender of France. Mohammed, the founder of Islam, a name that is uh, uh, marked in history. Harriet Tubman. She engineered and uh, operated the Underground Railroad during our Civil War. George Washington, the father of our country here. William Wilberforce <clears throat> was God's hands and feet in England, trying to break the, the bonds of slavery in England and set African uh, English people uh, free there. Uh, Alfred, uh, Adolf Hitler, if I mention his name, he's a madman. He was a destroyer. Vladimir Lenin, he was the organizer of the Communist Party. Martin Luther King, his dream is still alive in America today and around the world. If you you travel around the world, you mention Martin Luther King and everybody's ears perk up. They know him and who he it was. Other names that were kind of infamous, like Jim Jones. When you hear that name, you think of uh, just the the disaster, the death and destruction that he brought on the world. I can't uh, hear his name without seeing those dark sunglasses that he always wore. And uh, that one picture uh, in Ghana where all those people, there was over 900 people committed suicide. Um, the list goes on and on, recording the names of those people who have marked mankind for good or evil. Throughout history, there's been notable and notorious people both but there has never been one life that has ever affected mankind as uh, indelibly as the life of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He has uh, transcended ages uh, throughout history uh, with a timeless message. His message is one of forgiveness and mercy and grace. He was and remains one of a kind today. I want you to listen to this. <clears throat> The city was divided. No national army had invaded or erected walls keeping the people inside. There were unseen barriers that divided people. The walls of ideas, thoughts, and lifestyles were enslaved and entrenching young people and old people alike into their respective camps. Some camps were built around religious ideas of superiority and purity. There were many that refused to be tainted by fool's food or a lack of respect for high holy days. They were convinced that their power rested in the recognition of the power of angels, in the power of purification, in the power of putting all of their thoughts in order. They knew better than to mingle with the masses of polluted people since they had received knowledge from on high. There were others who had no use for religion at all. They were fast-paced businessmen who peddled their wares downtown. Since this city was a port, they had the opportunity to send and receive goods via the water routes around the world. All of the talk of religion and theology bored and distracted them from attending to what they thought was truly important. Alongside of these camps existed the welcoming committee of the city. They weren't officially appointed, but their lifestyle reflected that attitude as they welcomed every new idea that floated into that city with open arms. There was a strange mix of various religious ideas, self-improvement, cultish commitments, and an endless search for significance amidst the maddening rush of the city. In the middle of the division and deluge of thoughts of what makes life count was a little church of unassuming folks 
who received a letter of encouragement and counsel. A man penned a letter whom had never visited the city, but who had heard of the faith of the few and wanted to offer his support and suggestions for holding fast to the truth. Now, this town that we're talking about here is the town of Colossae. More than 1,900 years ago, and the person that wrote this letter to him was the Apostle Paul. And it sounds familiar if you kind of read that letter and you hear the the uh, description of it, with the exception of the port city. It uh, sounds a little bit like Nicholasville or maybe some other towns across the United States. It was a confusing time for these these people, just as confusing as it is today for many people who are constantly being bombarded by a whole bunch of ideas and suggestions that are vying for our attention. There are many questions that come up to us today about what is right and what is wrong, and we base those answers that we come up with a lot of times based on what we hear from other people. There was a battle of sorts going on for the minds and the souls of the people of the city, and Paul wanted to offer encouragement to those who trusted in Jesus. As it was in Colossae, so it is in Nicholasville and around the United States today. We live in a confusing time. We live in a confusing time as more and more new ideas continue to come about. If you think about the acceleration of discovery, there's all these new things that are coming out. And they're about what things make our life uh, worth living, how we can find peace, how we can rise above the heartaches and the disappointments of our individual lives. Now, I've been studying these letters to Colossae this week. And while studying them, I'm constantly reminded of the war that's going on for our attention or our hearts or our minds or the souls of the people that we know today. It happening today just like it was 1900 years ago. There are so many conflicting ideas warring for the attention of us day in and day out. Think about these people that read tarot cards. You know, when I was doing this, I wrote this down. I said, last night I saw on television where somebody was saying that you could dial a 1-900 number and you could find out about your future just by, you know, $7.36 a minute or whatever that price of it is. And while I was rehearsing yesterday, the TV was on and that commercial came on. And I thought, well, confirmation, this is what I'm supposed to talk about. But there are people out there, this this particular organization said that uh, the best psychics from California we guarantee you the best reading of your lifetime or 100% return of your money. Just call this 1-900 number and they'll tell you all about your, your future. At the same time, people that not only trying to make uh, suggestions about your future, but your current situation. Think about Bill Gates. All the media, all the advertising that's out day in and day out about iPhones, iPads, uh, Mac computers. And Bill Gates once said, and this is something that we need to have in the back of our mind, and I have an iPhone on my hip, I have an iPad, and I have a Mac computer. But Bill Gates once said that he could think of better things to do with his time than go to church and be bored. So we need to be aware of who is telling us what. I can tell you about other groups that are offering insight to you on how to live a better life. Groups like the Church of Scientology, you know, superstars like Tom Cruise and John Travolta and Christy Alley attend those churches, all having this enlightened direction. There's other enlightened directions. There's gurus out there. One's called Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Bakshwani Sheree Rajneesh. These are all people that have ideas about how to make your future better, And they're counterfeit messiahs because they're promising something that they can't deliver on. In this whirlwind of ideas that's out there in our media, in our television, our radios, and our newspapers, stands the church. Believers that stand together, standing strong, never vacillating, never retreating from speaking up about the one person who died on the cross and telling the world with one voice that Jesus Christ was one of a kind. Or is that what the case really is? I mean, do we really do that? Do we really stand up in one voice, never vacillating? Today, the world seems to be becoming even more confused as church people try to figure out, is Jesus really one of a kind? Newsweek, several years ago, ran an article 
they, about uh, sending a large box to the Vatican. It was addressed to, uh, it came out of California, coincidentally, and it was addressed to His Holiness John Paul II at the Vatican. And the shipping label had a return address of about a dozen countries from every continent on the planet Earth except for Antarctica, and it had a number written down there. The number was 40,388. And that number represented the number of signatures inside that box as a petition. Each signature was attached to a petition asking the Pope to exercise his power of papal infallibility to proclaim a new dogma for the Catholic Church. And here's what it was. They wanted Mary to be, uh, Mary the mother of Jesus, to be placed on an equal level with Jesus as Redeemer and Savior. Now, <clears throat> Mary was a wonderful person. Uh, no one has ever uh, def refuted that. So it wouldn't be a bad idea to elevate Mary to some kind of status. She was the mother of God. Except that in the Bible, it says in 1 Timothy 2, 5, it says there is but one God and one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. There is only one mediator. It's written in the scriptures. In the Acts 4, 2, there's another one that says that there is no other name given to man by which they may be saved except the name of Jesus. Not Mary, but Jesus, the only one. Well, you might say 40,388 signatures for all the Catholics in the world isn't a lot of people. But before that box arrived at the Vatican, they had already received 4.3 million signatures asking that Mary be raised to the same level as Jesus. Came from 157 countries around the world. The world asking to discount what the Bible says, that Jesus is the only way to the Father, and put Mary in there with him. Supporters of Mary, listen to this, supporters of elevating Mary to Jesus' level include people like Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She wanted to do that. Cardinal John O'Connor of New York, and nearly 500 bishops and 41 cardinals wanted to elevate Mary to the same level as Jesus. Confusion is becoming the norm sometimes. We have a Savior that's calling on us to stand up and say, we are not changing the Word of God. What it said when it was written 2,000 years ago stands today. You can go out and you can walk Buddha's noble eightfold path. You can do that, but you'll never find eternal life through that. You can bow to Mecca five times a day, but one day you're going to bow to Jesus. You can look for answers in a tail of a comet, but the truth will not come from a comet. It comes from a king. You can sit in the lotus position and chant mantras, but you are still going to have to confess one day that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can blow all of this off as nonsense only to serve yourself, but one day you'll learn that everything is in vain except for him. In a country that's becoming increasingly muddy about fixed ideas of hope and salvation and what's right and what's wrong, there is an increasing need for people of God, the church, us, to know their stuff. We need to be able to state clearly with no confusion the truth about who Jesus is or we will only further confuse those people around us. Clear communication is the key for those who live especially in such a diverse society as the one we live. Even in the secular world, some of the corporate giants are finding out that how important it is to communicate very clearly and very succinctly with uh, their customers if they're ever going to have a profit. When Gerber first started selling baby food in Africa, they p packaged it exactly like it was packaged in the United States. You know that picture, that pretty little baby on the front of it? Well, in Africa, when you package something, you put a picture of what's inside on the outside label. So people were seeing ground-up babies in bottles. And obviously, they didn't sell very well. <sighs> When Pepsi started marketing its products in China, they translated their slogan, which at the time was, Pepsi brings you back to life, 
literally on the labels. And when they put those Chinese characters on there, what it actually said was, Pepsi brings your ancestors back from the grave. That was, they're unclear. The Chevy Nova never sold well in any Spanish-speaking company because Nova in Spanish means it does not go. Coors put its slogan uh, on a, uh, out a few years ago. It says, uh, turn it loose. That was their slogan. In Spanish, that means suffering from diarrhea. They put that on their on their slogans. When Braniff decided to upscale their air, airlines, they put uh, new upholstery in all their planes. And their, lo- their slogan became fly in leather. And in Spanish, that was translated as fly naked. We need to be very careful how we say what we say. And this was Paul's concern when he was writing this letter to the people in Colossae. He wanted to state very clearly for them and very succinctly, as clearly as possible, the uniqueness of who Jesus Christ was and the fallacy of those people that were misrepresenting the truth. So in the first section of this letter that Paul wrote, he wants to make the believer aware of the false teachings that were leading people astray. See, there's many followers of Jesus Christ today who are buying into all kinds of deception about who he is simply because they don't know any better. It's not bad people. I've seen people, many people, that have come to the Lord and they get baptized and they get a little bit of information and they start making assumptions based on that good ideas. But it's not the truth. There are pivotal, life-impacting situations that we have throughout our life that we go through that will make us very vulnerable to outside opinions and interpretations. I recently read something about <clears throat> college kids when they uh, kids leave home and go off to college, uh, especially in the, in the more liberal Eastern Coast colleges that uh, these college campuses are one of the main mission fields for people who prey on vulnerable college students. College kids are usually, when they first go to college, they're trying to figure out who they are, what they want to be, what they want to do when they grow up, but they're trying to identify the character of their personality. And cults are becoming more and more aggressive about preying on these people because of all the stress that they're under. They're away from home, they're away from their churches, they're away from positive influence, and they can be led astray down a a negative path. That's why it's so important for us, and I, I love it when the kids are in this room and they're listening when we have a, a subject that we can talk about in front of them because we're teaching them the truth. It is the truth. It is the truth. It's not an opinion. It's something that's a truth. And it's so important that we do that over and over and over again in our homes that we talk about this is what, uh, this is what you need to do, son or daughter. This is how you need to conduct yourself. And the reason for it is is because it's supported in the Scripture. And we talk about things like that that support you and make, uh, <clears throat> encourage your kids along those same lines too. But when we're in a crisis, like a failing marriage, a terminal illness, any kind of extreme pressure, pressure of any kind, we are more and more vulnerable to accept strange teaching from those on the outside that are trying to influence us with some of these bizarre ideas. I have known people <clears throat> who were told by doctors that there is no hope. A bad med- uh, message from the doctor, there is no hope. This is a terminal situation that you have. And out of that shock and that disbelief and that desperation to want to live and continue living, these people sometimes will turn to some of the most bizarre things. Psychics, faith healers, snake oil salesmen, new age mystics, all with a promise to heal their eels, ills. And as a result, they get st- sucked into some of these strange religious ideologies. And when they get sucked into these strange idea, ideologies, they get taken away from the church and away from Christ. It's not enough for us as Christians to simply confess that we are Christ followers. We need to have the knowledge and the truth inside of us that, God, uh, that God's word delivers that will equip us to withstand the attacks of the enemy. One of the greatest tools that deceivers will use, and especially in these college things, is uh, to move into their lives is to use friendship. They'll go in, they'll be your buddy. 
Uh, this is what happens in some of these uh, religious cults, even with the adults. They'll be your buddy. When they want you to go out and, and misbehave with them, they'll be your friends first. And then they'll introduce to you some of these other ideas that will take you further away from what's true and right and what is just. The tragedy is, is that the same tool that we're supposed to be using. You know, we're supposed to be friendly. We're supposed to be warm and inviting with people around us and make friends. And then once we make friends, once we have uh, some uh, credibility with people that we've just met, then we can help share our faith. Christians should be using to bring people to Christ the same tools that unbelievers use to take you away from Christ. So you have to ask the question of yourself, when was the last time that you went out of your way to introduce yourself to someone that you didn't know? When was the last time that you were just bold enough to walk up to someone and say, hey, my name's Brad. I'd like to meet you. How are you? This is who I am. And try to become a friend of theirs so that you can share your faith with them. When was the last time that you invited a person that you've never invited to your church before? When's the last time that you said, uh, hey, I'd love to see you come to our church. Mike and I were talking about uh, somebody that he invited, a friend of mine today, to invite to church. While we sit back and mind our own business, there are people out there who are peddling lies about our faith. They're busy making new friends and luring them in. Well, after Paul lays down uh, the heresies which were running rampant in the street, he goes on to teach the believers in Colossae that uh, allegiance to Jesus will transform your individual lives. Paul says that our relationships will be changed when we commit to the Lord. Our speech will be changed. Our habits will be changed. Our loyalties will be changed. Our character will be changed when we surrender to the Lord. It was a challenging message for the folks in, in Colossae, and believe me from the silence in this room today, it's a challenging message for us to hear today too. Have your thoughts, have your actions, have your ways of conducting your life day to day been changed since you Gave your life to the Lord? If not, I think you need to uh, ask the Lord to examine your heart and see if you have truly committed your life to Christ. Marshall Applewhite, he was the leader of the Heaven's Gate cult. He was raised in a Christian home. His father was a preacher. And he went through a tough time. He entered into a season of tragedy and uh, trouble in his life. And he turned to a friend of his for for comfort, a friend was a nurse, and she had the answer to all of his problems. And he followed her instead of following Christ, and we all know about Heaven's Gate and how many people died there. You and I are in dire need of growing in our faith, being challenged to step up our communication and our commitment to Jesus. Or we, like Marshall Applewhite, the myriad of other people who have lost their way will find ourselves losing our way as well. Listen to these words. There is no other name under heaven given to us by God by which we will be saved from our sins, our slavery, our sickness of heart, soul, and mind. Jesus is one of a kind. He's the only one. And so are you. Never forget that. Never forget that God needs you. Do you ever think about that? God needs us. He needs you and he left specific instructions for you. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That wasn't just a poetic writing. That was instructions to every person here. Each one of us has been uniquely made to do exactly what Christ has called us to do, and that is to teach people, baptize them. Scriptures say, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Do you think that was an accident? Do you think that that happened, that, that there's some kind of a stamp that comes out and that when God makes people, it's just stamp, here's another one, stamp, here's another one, stamp, here's another one. I worked at Toyota. 
Pat and I did. We manufactured cars. There were some different colors there, but every one of them had the same thing. God does not do that. He manufactured each one of us specifically with a specific purpose in mind. Each one of us. What an honor that is. Listen to this. Now about those and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagan, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. You can't do it. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them all. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everything, there's the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by the means of that same Spirit. To another, faith by that same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. To still another, the interpretation of tongues. All are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one of us as He determines. That's that's the truth. Imagine this. God creating us and then gifting us for a specific purpose, and then we don't do it. What a tragedy that is. What a tragedy that would be. So my question to you, are you using your unique gifts to serve the kingdom? Are you doing that or are you not? Have you been uniquely gifted and made for a specific person and determined that you're not going to do it? It's tough. And also, are you armed to do it? And that's where we need to be really educated, especially in the lives of our children. We need to teach them daily the truth that comes through the Scriptures so that when that day comes or they go to uh, Berkeley (laughs) or Yale or Harvard or University of Kentucky, will they know the truth? 1 Peter 3.15 says, Always be prepared to have an answer for the faith that you have. So that when someone comes up to you and says, so you got a bad reading from the doctor? Let's go to a mystic. I know a, I know a tarot card reader that might be able to give you some insight there. You say, no, I don't stand on that. I stand on the power that comes from Jesus Christ. All of this is a package, and just to put a bow on it. Ron asked me a good question yesterday, and, and I've asked myself this, but uh, to be reminded of it. And he, he asked me, he says, is everyone that come to our church saved? I said, well, I I think so. Horrible uh, comment for me to make. I should know the answer to that. But the the path to salvation is is, um, oftentimes a difficult path, but it's an easy path too. And I'm just going to ask to make your confession. If you haven't made it, uh, this is a time to make it. Stating your faith and your confidence in who Christ is and surrendering your life to him. If you would just repeat that with me. I believe believe that Jesus is the Christ, the the Son of the living God, God, my Lord and my Savior. Savior. I believe in my heart here that if you believe that you are honest and true, I believe that you are saved today. If you never were before, if you spoke those words out loud, now I think there's some things that you need to do. And Ron and I talked about this yesterday. And we're going to set aside a day for baptism. And it's going to come up in the month of August. And we're going to try to schedule this at the Alpha Farm in Nicholasville because that's a clean creek. (laughs) It's not a clean creek, but uh, it's it's a creek. (laughs) But we're going to set aside a day for baptism there because there's a lot of, or there may be people in this room who have not been baptized by immersion. And we want to give you the church a day that uh, we can mark in our calendar and we can say this is the day that we're going to do it. There's no more scheduling. I used to have a guy that attended this church. Ron and I were talking about the, the other day. And this guy would come to me almost every week. And he said, Brad, I need to be baptized. And I said, dude, let's do it. 
when when you want to go well I'll, I'll let you know and I don't know if he ever was baptized but not by me or not by anybody I know so we're going to set that aside we're going to set aside we've set aside today as a day for the church to make their confession of faith and we're going to set aside a Sunday in in August where if you have not been baptized um, you can be baptized also, there are several people, too, uh, friends of mine. I know many pastors that have done this as they were baptized early in life. And now that they were into adulthood, they felt like God was calling them to do that again, to mark time one more time, that maybe their heart wasn't right then. Maybe they were baptized because uh, the other kids in their Sunday school class were getting baptized uh, m m maybe there's nothing. I mean, there's no confusion in that. I remember the day that Pat and I were baptized together. We fully jumped over that line. There was nothing held back. We we didn't sit there and go like, well, I'm going to be in church, you know, sometimes. We we didn't do that. We went, we're in, 100%. Um, but uh, I also remember when I was 12 years old, my dad came to me and he says, uh, son, the boys in the church are getting baptized. Would you like to get baptized with them? I said, I don't know, I guess. I, you know, if they're doing it, I guess I, I guess I will. I don't know what happened that day. That only the Lord knows that, uh, truly knows the, the, the condition of my heart. But for somebody that comes up to me and says, you know, I, was re, I recommitted my life to the Lord. First thing I think of is what was wrong with the first commitment? <laughs> you know, what, what did you, you lie or, you know, but if there's something inside of you that says, I just want to mark time one more time. Uh, that that would be a great day for you to do this. So we're going to let you let you know about that when it comes up. <clears throat> we also want to talk to you tonight a little bit about movie night for Friday night. Last couple of weeks, our attendance has been really soft, and uh, we've been talking a little bit about well, are we going to continue to do that, or maybe maybe that's not uh, something that this church needs to be involved in, or maybe we need to. I thought s summers would be a good time, kids out of school, that would be a good Friday night thing, but maybe it's something that we needed to be doing in September. So uh, we're going to give that a couple of more weeks maybe and take a look at it and see what happens. But the last two weeks we've come in and, and gone home uh, because uh, no, one, no one showed up for it. So uh, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a great community idea. Um, but uh, if it's not going to work, it's not going to work. And Pat and I have ordered... Uh, God's Not Dead and Heaven is for Real. Those are two great, relatively new released movies that we have on order. One's going to be in the end of July and one's going to be in the first couple of weeks of August. So we're definitely going to be doing those movies. And uh, if you don't go to any others, you need to go to the, those to see those. Those are great, encouraging movies. I also want to let you know that uh, <coughs> um, uh, Monday nights, we have had a group of men about... 10, 12 men meeting here every Monday night at 6 o'clock uh, going through a 12-step program to celebrate recovery, and they graduated. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, how many months did that take, Mike? How many? Eight and a half months to go through it, about 12 men. I think there was only a couple uh, from this church that was here. As Mike was bringing men from around the community. So Mike is working diligently to instill a Celebrate Recovery program in this church. Now, if you're not familiar with Celebrate Recovery, you're putting words together and you're thinking, well, if I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict, this is the thing that I need to be a part of. Not the case. This is for anybody with any kind of hurt, habit, or hang-up that interfere with their ability to commune with God. So this could be anger, this could be codependency, where you're just so enamored with some person that it distracts you from the Lord. It could be uh, anger, it could be cigarette smoking, it could be uh, a foul language, it could be anything in your life that puts a uh, distance between you and God. Mike's going to be doing that, he's working right now. Everybody that's been here on Monday night has been men, but he's putting together some leaderships to bring in for women to run through a 12-step program. It will change your life if it'll change your life. So I just wanted to say congratulations to Mike uh, for doing that, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Also want to let you know that Ken is taking a pilgrimage on Tuesday. He's going to the ungodly Georgia, the land to the south of us. He's going down there, and he's uh, going to be looking at a position down there as a country club pro, golf pro, and uh, I'm conflicted. I want to I want to pray that it's successful for you, but 
if it's successful for you, it means you're gone, and uh, that would be horrible. So I'm conflicted. I'm praying on one knee, not both knees, for that. Uh, I also uh, want to let you know we got a couple of birthdays here today. I am 12 today. Whose birthday? Both of you 12? 13? 11 and 13? 14? Happy birthday. Yeah. That's good. I just want to wrap up and, and let you know that um, it, it, was, uh, it was so cool for us to, to go over to Bridge Church and, and worship with them because we'd been there when it was the vineyard. And uh, my kids uh, have attended the Vineyard Church in Cincinnati. It's a big church, about 4,000 uh, weekly attenders. And uh, we've had the privilege of being up there and uh, baptized two of my daughters and one of my grandsons up there in that church. And so uh, we came to the Vineyard a couple of times in Lexington just so we could kind of be uh, connected with that group and different people that we knew there. And that, anyway, the Vineyard moved out of this building and Bridge Church moved into it. And... Uh, it was just fun to go there and, and listen to their worship team and uh, be able to share with them <clears throat> and uh, meet a group of different people. There was one old woman. I don't know who, the, do you remember her name? Real thin lady who was dressed up so sweet. Margaret. She was, uh, <clears throat> everybody that was in that church walked up and hugged that old woman. And uh, I walked around and said, I don't know why everybody's coming over here hugging on you, but I got to get in on this. And she's like, come on in, honey. So it was a great, fun thing to do, but uh, but it's not uh, the mountain, and uh, it's good to be back home. Let me pray for us, and then uh, we'll get on to some discussion. That's just question, question, are you using your unique gifts to serve the kingdom? If not, why not? Well, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this church body that you've given us. Thank you for each one of these faces that you've placed in these seats today that uh, warm Pat's heart, my heart, Jennifer, Ron, God, so many others. It's, uh, this church is our family, and we're so blessed to be here. Thank you for that, Father. Thank you for the continued reminder of our commitment to your Son and the identification of who he is and to remain firm in that. And when the winds of change come uh, through our city, that we can stand firm in the Scriptures and say no. Uh, Mary is not equal to Jesus. The scriptures say that and stand firm on truth and not on uh, the waves of change in our community. So thank you for that, Father. Thank you for a body of people that comes together to love each other and to encourage each other and to support each other. Thank you for that, Father. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Ever feel left out? Ever feel like you just don't understand? Or that nobody understands you? You ever feel like nobody cares? Come climb the mountain. It's nothing like you've ever seen. Our philosophy is simple. Love God, love people. The Mountain Community and Christian Learning Center. It's faith, it's family, and it's friends. Stroll in, grab a donut, some coffee, and grab a seat. Enjoy the company of a warm, welcoming family of Christ followers as we encourage, support, and worship together. No Sunday's best here. Simply come as you are. Come as your own Father would have you. On Sundays, 9 a.m. is Happy Hour Fellowship with a message from Pastor Brad Allred or a guest speaker starting at 10. If you're looking for a church family or simply looking for a change, stop by and visit. We'd love to have you.